Good morning, Brendan. Happy Sabbath. Three, four yeah, times, yeah, yeah, not yeah. six, yeah. eight. No.
Emmanuel sagt das Bild. Emmanuel. Emmanuel.
Good morning and happy Sabbath to one and all. Morning. morning. You can do much better than that. Happy Sabbath. Happy, happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Oh, that's wonderful. Please join us in singing uh, a few songs with us. And we would, I'd like to request all of you to stand up. And we sing the song, Something Beautiful. just you know he just takes mud together and he forms it in i'm talking about a potter taking mud 
and making it into a beautiful piece of art, I would say, a pot. And it's just like us. We're broken. And yet, he forms us. He conforms us in a very beautiful way. Especially because we are in his sight. Let's sing this beautiful song, 10,000 Reasons. good all the, all, time. The time. all the time all the time god, god is, is good. good let's sing this song let the fire fall
Try this again. We'll sing the last, <laughs> the last, last verse. verse. Sing it together. Pentecostal fire descend. Don't we just long for more of that? Amen. And I'm looking around Sabbath school this morning, and I think we've got some more than normal. So maybe it's growing. Hallelujah. I'm glad to see you here, and I want to give you a great, big, warm welcome. Today, we have our new president, who I have never met, but I know what he looks like because I checked him on Facebook. He didn't realise he was preaching until this morning, but he is. And uh, you're ready to go, aren't you, mate? Um, Pastor Terry Johnson, can you give us all a wave and let's give him a warm welcome. We're glad you're here, mate, and we're glad you came to Sydney and I know you're going to enjoy it. Is this 
Is this the first church in Sydney you've preached at today as the president? Oh, okay. <laughs> We're still glad you're here. <laughs> we, we're going to brag about that, but um, I think you've only been in the job. We'll do an interview in church, but you've only been in the job a few weeks, eh? And you're still living in Western Australia. So you're just over here by yourself. Well, we're glad to have you here and welcome, welcome. And I'm glad to have all you guys here. Welcome and to our new, our new Hope live stream viewers. Uh, we love you joining online, but if you're in Sydney, we'd rather you're here. But welcome, welcome. You know what? Um, I took my dogs for a walk this morning. A few years ago, I was kind of sinking into depression. Very bad time in my life. And I've told some of you how one of the things my dad said is, hey, go for a walk. And think about the good things God's doing for you. And I'm on this walk this morning and I'm thinking about the good things God's doing and I'm talking to him and I'm thanking him. And I look down and guess who's walking with me still? Lucky. She, the vet told me. We went on holidays in February, Liz. We, never, we weren't sure we'd come back and lucky would be alive. She's got cancer. And she just looks fabulous. I don't know whether it's a diet, Liz, because perhaps you better put me on the same diet, babe. <laughs> I don't know whether it's a diet or what it is, but she, and I, I, you know, here we are on the Sabbath. Praise God even for the little things he does, eh? He is so good. And we're going to have some, some beautiful Bible study now. We're going to separate. I'm going to pray and then we're going to separate. Uh, so let me pray and then I'll just share with you what's going on. Dear Lord Jesus, um, it has been a troubled week for the world again. Uh, even for me, Lord, as we went up and watched a friend get buried, it was troubling. And some of us have come here troubled today. Others have come here, Lord, just on top of the world. But however we've come, may you bless us as we do these Bible studies and may we, I pray, see Jesus. In your name, amen. Our kids are going to follow. <laughs> see ya. <laughs> I gotcha. Give them a wave, see ya. All our kids right through to teens, mums and dads, make sure you go outside and sign them in. And then after Sabbath school, go and sign them out. And uh, here in the church, we've got Pastor Kevin. He's going to be continuing our prophecy series and he's doing that for more of those who are who are looking at Adventism and looking at our beliefs and, and, and just considering what we believe. And outside in the foyer, who's doing it today? Aaron is doing the Sabbath school lesson. I really encourage your Adventist people to go to that because these lessons are sensational on righteousness by faith. So I'll just give everybody a few minutes to get to where they're going. And then Pastor Kevin, you're on here, mate. Well, good morning all. Uh, it's good to see we have a, still have a good number of uh, people uh, to join us at this lesson and uh, look forward to any participation you might be able to offer. I'll do my best to be inclusive, um, maybe off, offer the random question here or there. And uh, regardless of that, I hope that uh, the lesson today is helpful to you. So I'd just uh, like to offer a word of prayer before we uh, start into that. Just pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you this morning that we can open your word together. We thank you for the promise of your spirit to guide and teach us and pray, Lord, that uh, our hearts will be teachable and open to you, that we might learn things that will uh, help us in our Christian experience. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as you may recall, the last few lessons have been dealing with Revelation 13, uh, today we're going into Revelation 14. Uh, Lloyd uh, advised or encouraged me to skip past the first five verses. We're going to launch straight in 
to what we know as the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Now, as a denomination, as a movement, we have identified ourselves for decades as the movement that has been given the uh, commission to preach the three angels' messages. It's very much a part of our identity. And uh, many old-time Adventists will know that uh, the logo that the church embraced for much of our um, history has been the three angels uh, flying in the midst of heaven. And uh, only in recent times has uh, a newer, more stylistic type of logo been adopted to the chagrin of some. But nonetheless, we are a movement with a commission and uh, we believe very much that this passage we're going to look at today is, is central to who we are as a people and what God has called us to do. So I want to uh, focus right in on the text and we're going to pull the text apart as we go through this passage and see what it has to say to us and how we can apply it to our lives today. Of course, uh, written uh, 2,000 years ago by John the Revelator, but a message which is very, very timely. It's a message for end time people. You can look at the context here, what we've looked at in Revelation 13, very much relevant to the end of time, and also the following on from here, very much about the second coming of Jesus. So let's first of all look at verse 6, and uh, I hope Andrew or his team will be able to put that up on the screen, or follow along in your Bibles. Okay, so John says this, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. By the way, I'm using the New King James, which I see is what's being used on the screen. Um, let's pull this apart a little bit. First of all, do we understand what an angel means in Bible symbolism? It's a messenger, that's right. If you look at the original language, angelos simply means messenger. Um, referencing John the Baptist, I think uh, it might have been Isaiah, but an Old Testament prophet said he would be a messenger. And the word used is angelos in the Greek language. So angel simply means messenger. And Seventh-day Adventists, again, as I said before, we identify ourselves very much as the messengers that God has given or called upon to proclaim the messages of Revelation 14. So here we are. We are the messengers uh, called by God, the earthly messengers uh, called upon to proclaim the message. What about where it says there that the angels are flying in the midst of heaven? Well, we live in a very amazing time in Earth's history. You know, you could um, think of things like Adventist World Radio, Hope Channel, 3ABN, Hope Ch uh, New Hope TV, um, and all these various other technical means of being able to proclaim a message. The World Wide Web satellite technology, um, you know, not to mention the fact that we have missionaries scattered all throughout the world. Yeah, almost every country. I'll come back to that point in a moment. But this is a message that has a global or universal application. Everybody in the world, we're told, needs to hear these messages. And so we, as the messengers, have been called upon to proclaim, as it says in verse 7, with a loud voice. Uh, so it says that these angels are flying in the midst of heaven and uh, they have something particularly. They have the everlasting gospel to preach to all the world. So I think this is the only time in the Bible where the expression everlasting gospel is used. So what do we to make of that? I think um, Paul says it well in the book of Galatians where he says, if any man preaches any other gospel other than what I have proclaimed to you, let him be cursed. There is only one true gospel, isn't there? And this is a gospel that has been proclaimed right from the very beginning. God himself in Genesis 3.15, said to Adam and Eve and to the serpent there that the seed of the woman would come along and crush the head of the serpent. That was the gospel for that era. And the gospel is still the same. Jesus saves. Jesus will conquer evil and deliver his people. And uh, if you go forward in history, you find Abraham in Genesis 12, I think. Or oh, hang on, Genesis 15. 
He believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed it was righteousness by faith for Abraham way back there 2,000 years before Jesus. He understood the gospel. He believed what God had promised and it was counted to him for righteousness. And so the idea that there's this covenant theology of Old Testament people were saved by their works or legalism or obedience to the law, whereas New Testament people are saved by grace, it's a nonsense. The gospel has always been the same. It is the eternal or everlasting gospel that God has asked us to proclaim to our world. So that's the commission. Uh, We can't unpack the the entirety of that gospel message, but this is what we're called upon to do. And where it says to preach or proclaim or to announce the good news, there's a special Greek word used there, to announce good news. That's what we are called upon to do. And so the rest of the message, why it may be confronting in some respects, it's good news for those who will pay heed to it. So to all those who dwell on the earth, what does it say in Matthew 24, 14? Anyone got a good uh, recollection of that? One of the signs of the end when, before Jesus will come? Lloyd? This gospel we preach to all the world as a witness unto all nations and then the end will come. So all the people who live in the world at the end of time will hear the gospel message. And even to add further weight to this idea, John goes on to say, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people. You know, there's probably something around 220 or 30 odd sovereign nations in our world today. And uh, you'll find if you look at the, or something like this for example, This is quite an old document now, but produced by the American Bible Society. And here's a graph. Along the top, it shows all the various um, denominations, church denominations, preaching uh, throughout the world. And down the vertical column, it shows all the countries in the world in which those particular denominations are doing their work. And it's not hard to guess for us that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in almost every country in the world doing the work that God has called us to do. Isn't that incredible? Such a small denomination of around 20 odd million people and I understand the only other denomination that is anywhere near us is, guess who? None other than the Catholic Church. None of the other denominations come anywhere near the extent of the work that that we are doing as a denomination and praise God for that. Whether it be uh, health clinics, whether it be schools, publishing houses, hospitals, Uh, education systems, churches, missionaries uh, going out into the far-flung parts of the world. We are actively seeking to fulfil by God's grace the the commission to take this gospel message to all the world. When I was at college uh, back in the late 90s, I discovered that while we are doing an amazing work, it's greater in extent than I had imagined. Now, not only do we have to go to all these various sovereign nations, it says every nation, tribe, tongue and people. How many language groups are there in somewhere like India or New Guinea? How many language groups? Can you just even imagine that? Each of these people groups need to be reached, don't they? And uh, we, we're attempting things like the God Pods. Have you heard of those? We go to the Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert with these God Pods and speak to them in their own mother language. It's incredible. We're seeking to do what God has called us to do. It's an amazing uh, time in which we live to be able to um, reach out to these various nations, tribes, tongues and people groups. Um, the uh, the um, native peoples of Australia, how many different, uh, what could we call them tribal groups, peoples within our own country here? It's an amazing challenge that we are, uh, have been given, but by God's grace, we know that uh, the work will be done uh, with God's help. So let's press on to verse 7 now. There's this uh, angel crying out with a loud voice. What, does it think, what do you think it means when it says the words, he preaches with a loud voice? I'm going to wait for you to call out something with a loud voice. What do you think it means? It needs to be loud enough for people to hear. It needs to be spoken with conviction, doesn't it? It's an urgent, vitally important message. We need to speak it and preach it and proclaim it with conviction. And I believe that uh, as God uh, impels us by his spirit when the fire falls, 
with that uh, latter rain or early rain Holy Spirit experience, we will do it with such conviction that it will speak to the hearts of the people, that they know that what we're saying we truly do believe. And here's the next aspect of the message, fear God and give glory to him. What does it mean to fear God? Are we to be frightened of him? To reverence him? Anything else? To respect, to show awe and reverence. What about Job? You know what, Job, what the first verse of Job said about him? He was a godly man who feared God and eschewed evil. To me, to fear God means to obey him. Now, that may be heresy to some of you. I've heard some people say, well, to fear God here means to love him. Um, I'm sure we're called upon to love God. There's no question about that. But to me, to fear God is to obey him, to respect him to the point that we are happy to submit to him in every respect and obey his will. And by his grace, we will uh, be able to honour him. It says in the next passage there, to give glory to him. How can we fallen, broken human beings give glory to a God who is the perfect, holy being of the universe? Well, we're called upon to do that. Give glory to him. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So there's a, there's a challenging uh, part of this message to us today to live lives that will honour God. God is interested in the detailed aspects of our life. He's not watching over us like a... Like a um, oh, I better not use that expression because I'm one of them, uh, like an evil step-parent. I have step, a stepdaughter. But, you know, some people can be quite overbearing in the way they uh, control and demand people's compliance. But God is not like that. He gives us free will. But he asks us and invites us to live a life that will glorify him. It goes on to say, for or because the hour of his judgment has come. Now, there may be time in the weeks ahead to look more deeply at the issue of judgment, but I would say this. The judgment, in my understanding, is broken up into three phases. The pre-advent, the part of the judgment that happens before Jesus comes. The millennial judgment, the, the period of judgment that takes place during the thousand years after the second coming, and then what I call the executive judgment that takes place at the end of the thousand years where Satan and his followers are cast into the lake of fire, the ultimate destruction. So there's three phases of judgment that we understand, well, I understand in the Bible. Uh, it commences with the pre-advent, what we call investigative judgment, which must take place before Jesus comes. And again, we'll have time to look at that uh, into the future. And it says here, now remember, this is a little bit of a quandary for me, but written 2,000 years ago, and yet it says the time of the judgment has come. Past tense, it's already arrived. So this message must only have relevance for a particular time in history. It certainly didn't begin in John's time when he wrote it. But this message was identified by our pioneer people as a message, a timely message that was meant for them to give to the world. And so when our church began to arise, I think it was officially formed in 1863 or thereabouts, this is how we identified ourselves as a people and called upon to preach these messages to this broken, dying world. But the judgment has arrived. We are living now in the time of the judgment. And again, as I said, we'll have time to look at that further. The next aspect is to... Andrew, this clock's not working here, is that right? I've still got plenty of time, OK. Um, verse 7, the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So here we're, upon, we're called upon to worship who? The creator, that's right. We're called upon to worship the creator. Why? Why in all of this are we called upon to think about worshipping our creator? What does the first word in the fourth commandment say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God must have understood that there'd be a tendency for us to forget the importance and significance of that sabbath day what it's all about and the rest of this phrase here says to worship him who made the heaven the earth the sea and the springs of water 
If you were to go back to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, you would find almost the same words. Because he is the one who made the, the heavens, the earth, the sea and, the, and all that is in them, I think it says in the uh, fourth commandment there. So there's a direct reference and a direct allusion back to the fourth commandment here and a call upon to, a call to God's last day people to worship the creator. The Sabbath day is the day that reminds us that we have a creator, isn't it? And uh, we are his children, we belong to him. He made us in his own image, fallen though we may be. And it's, I find it interesting that um, around the same time that our church was beginning this work of proclaiming these messages, this uh, piece of work was being published. I'm not sure if you can see it up the back, it's called The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. In the uh, first page or so, it mentions that this was originally published in 1859-1860. Our church as a denomination was formed in 1863. Right at the very time that God had called this church and raised this movement up, this work was being disseminated very enthusiastically to the, to the world at that time. The idea of evolution, of course, does away with the idea of a creator. It does away with the work of a God who we would worship and honour in response to this message here. And particularly when you think of the messages we've looked at in the last two or three weeks from Revelation 13, there's this challenge to worship either the true God or the gods of this world. Worship the image of the God or the beast or the image of the beast, I should say, or the beast power, or worship God. And this is the challenge that we're brought to. And this um, philosophy, if you like, has become more and more accepted in society today to the point where Australia was once a, known as a Christian nation, formed upon Christian principles, is uh, no longer so. It's a secular country. And uh, in the recent census, I think it was something like, but uh, you could quote me, misquote me, 30% or something like that of people identified as Christians. And so this kind of philosophy is having a very, very big impact. And so God is asking us, inviting us to, to be prominent, be vocal, to be outspoken, to not uh, roll over, but to speak up and uh, let people know that we believe we came from the hands of a, a loving creator, God who sustains us in life. Uh, let's press on to verse 8, uh, please, uh, tech guys. Um, De uh, Revelation, uh, John now sees another angel, and in the, in the original language it says a second one, another angel, a second one, following this first angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. A little bit of unusual language here. So we see the second angel uh, come on the scene of action, subsequent to the first. So there's the sequential unfolding of these messages that have been given to share. And the message here, first of all, is that Babylon is fallen. Now, what does the term Babylon mean to you? We have the uh, city, the country of Iraq. They have the old ancient city of Babylon there. I think Saddam Hussein was in the process of trying to rebuild that when he was overthrown. But Babylon, of course, uh, is throughout the Bible uh, depicting the enemies of God's people, if I could say it that way. The original Babylon was known as Babel. And do you know what that word Babel means? Sorry? Chaos, yeah, confusion, chaos, that's right. And so uh, it was when God confused the language of the people who were attempting to build this tower up into the clouds, God said, I will confound their language or confuse their language and therefore they will be scattered abroad throughout the surface of the earth. And that's what happened, wasn't it? God destroyed their plans to, in their defiance of God, we will build a tower so that if he sends another flood, it won't trouble us. Of course, God had promised, remember, that he would never send another flood. But these people in their defiance of God decided that they would build a tower and a city. And the city's name became known as Babel or Babylon. So confusion or chaos or confounding has fallen upon the modern day churches. 
You know, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 2, I think um, verse 3, he said, let nobody uh, trouble you that the coming of Jesus is near because that time will not come until there is a falling away. I'm just paraphrasing very loosely here. But he, he foretold that there would be a falling away, an apostasy. Is the, it comes from the Greek word apostia or something like that. But there's a falling away from God's truth and false teachings and heresies and errors would be widely proclaimed and this would be a sign that Time is yet to be fulfilled. And uh, by God's grace, we know also that these heresies, these, uh, this falling away would be interrupted and the truths of God's word would be elevated and restored once again. And you see right throughout the Protestant Reformation, the Anglicans, the Lutherans, the Wesleyans, uh, and so forth, the Baptists have restored various aspects of Bible truth to the point today where we see the Bible in its completeness, or we are at least seeking to proclaim a biblical message we believe in the bible and the bible alone as the as the source and the authority of our faith and teachings rather than the traditions of the church and so the falling away was to happen but and we yet we see today such widespread um well confusion is the word i'll use maybe better words you know there's something like four thousand different christian denominations in the world today all using one, word, one Bible as their source of authority and yet, in practice, there's just such widespread confusion amongst the people who, are, who belong to those various churches. And so this Babylon or Babel or confusion is something that uh, we are to herald or to proclaim to the world to bring them out. It says in Revelation 18 that we are to call them out of Babylon call them out of confusion and we do that not by denouncing those false teachings or those systems of belief but by elevating Jesus and the truths of God's word by teaching the truth the lightness will dispel the darkness I believe there may be need to reference some of those false teachings but nonetheless by emphasizing the truth of God and his word I believe that we will be fulfilling God's purpose now it gets a little interesting here. Uh, she made, and it's interesting here, I, I don't know what I can say about this, but it says here that she, notice that she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I'm not sure why it's referencing this as a female, but uh, all the other references throughout the passage more more masculine. No, but nonetheless, um, this great city Babylon has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That reminds me of our previous studies where it said in Revelation 13, 8 that all the world wondered after the beast and worshipped the beast power except for who? Those whose names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, yes? So the whole world, maybe I've mis misphrased that, but all who dwell on the earth will worship him. That's the beast power whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So we find here that um, all the nations of the world, all the peoples of the world are buying into the teachings of this false system, this false religious system and are being challenged or, or, and, and ultimately it says here that, they, uh, that this power made all nations drink. There's some element of force or coercion or manipulation being used to, well, I'll say compel people to join with it in its apostasy and um, tragically the, the Bible seems very clear that the vast majority of people will fall for the deceptions and the lies of this system of worship and the wine of the wrath of her fornication I understand that in the next message it's going to tell us that God's wrath is going to be poured upon this world or upon those at least who have refused to heed pay heed to these warning messages and so this beast power like a um a spiteful child is going to not only bring himself down or herself down he's going to bring all he can with it bring the wrath of god upon all that he can the devil knows that his time is short he knows he's facing destruction he knows the word of god 
but he's intent on destroying as many as he possibly can to take them down with him. And so we, again, have this urgent, vitally important message to take to people, to warn them of the deceptions and the false teachings that are so pervasive in their religious world today. And her, the idea of this wrath of her fornication, I just noted here, this illicit union of church and state. Remember the uh, image of the beast was to be formed, we looked at last week and the week before. The image of the beast being this union of church and state that was so damaging throughout the Dark Ages period. We'll see this restored, whereby the church will use the state to enforce its dictates and the, and the state, the governments of the world will comply and allow the church to dictate its uh, agenda. Okay, we have the third uh, message now in verse 9, following in succession from the first two. Again, beginning with a loud voice, and he says there, and perhaps we'll read through to verse 11. A third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Just as I was reading that, I was re I re a thought came to my mind. When we were at, uh, studying my, our theology degree back in Avondale, one of the subjects was the book of Revelation. And uh, one semester only lasts for so long, so within that subject we had a limited time to study the entire book of Revelation, 22 chapters. Uh, that's not an easy task. But I'll never forget when we came out after studying Revelation 14, we came out of the class and one of my good friends... Uh, Pastor Sam Braga, he looked at me and he said, that's it, that's all we're going to get, one 50-minute lecture on the three angels' messages, I mean, that's who we are as a people, we're called upon to proclaim this message to all the world, it's who we are, and one 50-minute lecture covered it, he was very, very disappointed, but uh, uh, we have the privilege, of course, of accessing our Bibles, we can read it for ourselves, to our heart's content, and digest and learn and grow and share and uh, not be overly reliant upon one 50-minute lecture at college to, to find out what it's all about. I'm sure he had a pretty good idea before we got there what it was all about anyway. But here we have a most confronting message. We have a message that seems to threaten uh, people with God's wrath if they receive the mark of the beast. And so this is a sombre thing to contemplate. If we as a people are called upon to present this message. We have, no op we have no other option. We have to do it. But we must do it in a way that is appealing to people. We can't in any way condemn people or f use fear tactics to frighten people into, into coming on board with us. It's the love of God that is appealing, isn't it? I remember a guy preached a sermon many years ago and it was simply titled, Jesus is Attractive. And uh, how do you fit Jesus into a passage like that? God, this angry God, is going to pour his wrath unmixed with mercy upon those who defy him and follow the beast power. How do we reconcile a God of love with a God of anger, a God of wrath? Quite a challenging thing to do. But one small thing I could say is the Bible tells us that this is God's strange act. It's out of character, so to speak. It's defined, uh, def yeah, defined in, I think, uh, let me see. Um, maybe I didn't note it down. Anyway, it's somewhere it says in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that this is God's strange act. It's unusual for God to behave in this way. There's, there's um, examples where he has, uh, Noah's flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, so forth, where God has, uh, in his wisdom, deemed it necessary to, to intervene into earth's affairs and bring an end to outright rebellion. 
And I guess we trust his judgment when he does those things. At the end of time, in this world's history, we're going to see this tragic uh, series of events unfold whereby God will send the seven last plagues upon this world. Jesus will come and destroy the wicked. After the millennium, God will cast Satan and his followers into the lake of fire. A very unusual thing that the God of love to do. I'm getting the signal that uh, our time is over. Um, perhaps next week uh, Lloyd will determine just how we go about this, but let me just finish on this thought. Where it says there that the smoke of their torment will ascend forever, there's quite a number of biblical examples where it's very clear that forever does not mean forever eternally. It means for the duration of that person. Solomon's reign, it was described as forever, but it was for the duration of his life. And there's many instances, I've, I've noted a few, but I don't have the time to do that. But forever in our modern day thinking is all inclusive. But in the biblical mind, it has a duration, a relative duration to what it's actually referring to. So just keep that in mind. If, if you're not aware of uh, that, we could, you could come and see me and I could share the, the actual references I've chosen to, um, to um, select regarding that. Now, my clock says eight minutes too. Is that time for me to stop, Andrew, is it? Two minutes past. No, no look, I'll, I think I'll leave it there because the rest of the passage does continue on. I was intending to finish at verse 12, which is the next verse anyway, but we'll just perhaps leave that to our next presenter and um, be a part of how this continues on. So uh, thank you for your um, patient endurance, as verse 12 says, and um, you'll be able to come back and uh, finish it off next week. Let's have a prayer together to conclude. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in gratitude and respect, recognising that in your mercy and your wisdom you have revealed uh, to your Bible writers, these important messages. Lord, we pray that we can uh, wisely apply them and uh, lovingly and gently share them with other people that they might realise that um, time is short. These last day warning messages must be pr proclaimed and I pray, Lord, that as we do so, we will go in your might, in your power, in your grace and that uh, we will have effective uh, witness to um, the people we meet. Thank you, Lord, for being with us tonight, uh, this morning, and we just commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll just, have, we'll, we'll just have a few minutes break and then we'll all be back in church uh, for our worship service.
Good morning, church. Are you glad to be here to worship the Lord? Now, there's a few of us here, but there's many more coming. But before we go any further, I just want you to turn next to the person. Well, see if you can find someone you don't know and welcome them to church. And then while you're doing that, stand up and move to the center of the church. We need everybody. We don't, we don't really want anyone on the outside because those coming in are going to need seats on the outside. Can we get you all to move to the center? Everybody moving to the center, please. Okay, can we get every? Yeah, I think you have, pretty much. We don't want any seats spare on the outside because so many people come in, we want to have these seats. So if you can please move, please just move to the center. It makes it so much easier for us. So no one's sitting on the outside, everyone into the center so that those who come in um, can get a seat. All right, I'm glad you're here. We have a special day today. It's a bit unexpected. We have our new president, and you'll meet him soon, uh, visiting with us. Uh, and we'll talk about, we'll talk to him and find a bit more about him. But before we start, leave those side ones up, won't you, mate? Before we start, we'll just pray. Father in heaven, as we worship today, we all come here uh, expecting different things. But what draws us together and binds us together is we're looking to see Jesus in the, in the worship, in the music, and in the preaching. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be here, pressing down strongly upon those who are leading out and pressing upon our hearts, Lord, the love of Jesus. May we see him today. Oh, Lord, that's what we call for in your name. Amen. Now, Claire has a couple of announcements, and I'm going to say a little bit, and I think, Sia, where are you? Come forward, you have one too. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Okay, so next Sunday, we are doing Yes, We Care. So Yes, We Care is on to do the work coming Sunday. So I would like to see a show of hands. Who is planning on coming to do work on Yes, We Care Sunday? Hands up so I can count, please. Can you count for me too, please? Because I'm bad at this. Counting, not tomorrow, next Sunday. So count for me, please. Keep your hands up nice and high so I can see. About 30? About. Okay. Thank you. So come 9 o'clock sharp next Sunday. We're meeting at the gatehouse, so at the speed bump where the security office is. We'll meet just there, and we'll be finished by 12. I look forward to it, and I'm glad you guys are coming. Today we have lunch, you're all invited, even if it's your very first day here and you're feeling a bit weird about it or awkward, please come because you are invited. And tonight we have something very exciting. It is very exciting, isn't it Claire? Tonight is the bonfire night. I'm so grateful though, because you know it rained, what day was it? Thursday. It was heavy rain. And I said to Dwayne, that's it, if it keeps raining, we're canning it. But Friday was all fine, today is nice and sunny, so we are still having the bonfire. So what time is that on? Are you sure? Because some people were saying to me, seven? They said seven o'clock. What time is it? Five o'clock, okay? Otherwise, if you come any later, you're going to be lost because it's dark out where we live. Yeah, <laughs> there's not many lights. <laughs> One of my friends asked me where it was, and I told her the address, yeah. and then she looked it up, and that was like Hawkesbury spas and pools. <laughs> Did you guys look at that? that? That is their house, but it's not a pool shop. No, it's not. Look, on, on your GPS, if it comes up 74 Farm Road, uh, if Marsden Park doesn't come out, put Riverston, or like Riverstone, okay, and you'll pick it up. 
Oh, oh. Oh, listen, just get yourself there, okay? We've given you all the help. How much help do you need, okay? <laughs> okay, so what else? So you've got to be there at five. What else do you have to bring with you? Chairs. Yes, because I'm not going to provide you chairs. Come on. What is it? And invite your friends, okay? This is, you know what? This, I said to somebody this morning, this, having social is just as important as having a sermon. It's very important. So bring your friends to the bonfire and we will have a great time, okay? Five o'clock, bring your chair. And also too, um, you will meet my kids along the way. They're going to sort out the parking, okay? (laughs) Yeah, there's going to be a lot of people coming. I don't want cars everywhere. It's going to be orderly. So my kids will direct you and please be nice to them and do what they tell you to do, where to park your car. I was going to park in your garage. Oh, no. (laughs) All the houses are barred, okay? There's plenty of spaces to go around. So if you see them, please just follow the direction where there's heaps of places that you can find parking. Apart from that, we'll see you tonight. It is really important that we bring our friends to this. Um, I love the way we bring our friends to church here. Amen? Amen. But it's really good for them to come and to experience us having a good time outside of church. And the bonfire, this year, it's not at my place. It's at the other pastor's place. And it's only five minutes away from this church. And if you can't get there and you need a ride, then you come and talk to Claire. He'll be at the door there. Or me as you come out and we'll get you one. Because we want everybody to be there. But think of who you can bring along to this thing. Um, It's a great way to introduce people first to us and to who we are. Amen. Thank you, Lloyd. All right. If there's any other announcements, I don't have them. I'm going to call Nancy no, no. and Mike. Yeah, come forward, you guys. There is one more. What are we doing September 20, 22 and 23? Camping. This church will be closed. We've got a camp meeting. We're bringing all our television viewers in and all our supporters from all around Australia. We're praying they'll come and you need to start praying now. Hunty's got the tent. We've got the stage. We've got most of the people for the concert on the Saturday night. And it's just going to be a fabulous high weekend. The highest weekend, bar today because we've got the president here, (laughs) we'll have this, this year. And so keep putting that aside in your calendar. And again, start thinking who you can bring to this program. Why will it be exciting for the kids? Well, we'll be at the Hayora's place so they can swim in their dam. (laughs) It's the same place as the bonfire. It'll be exciting for the kids because there is a full-on kids program for that day from kindy through to teens. Um, And also, I think they'll like... Everyone, will en- it's just going to be a really vibrant time. Yeah. Good. I'm really excited about that. Big tents, like off MASH, sawdust bottoms. I'm going to take a big banner. I'm going to invite everyone from the community. Look at him. <laughs> we have a strange little Bible worker. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I get you. Because you're a camp girl. I love it. And I just think it's so, less, so much less scary than inviting someone to church. Inviting them to a big tent. Oh, and if we put a big enough banner up, put up in the, in the community in Riverston too, people might just rock up. Yeah, yeah. Actually, funny you say that because Andrew went to the council this week. Uh, Mr. President, <laughs> we're looking for money for land. <laughs> Grab him on the way out. We're, there's a reason we've got him here. <laughs> and Andrew actually asked this week, he said, if we bought a block of land, could we be, put a big tent up and worship in this? What do they say, hunty? Yes, so we can. Long as it's in an industrial area, because you can't put a church anywhere else in Sydney, we could put a tent up every week, Claire. <laughs> We're not going to do that. <laughs> Sorry, Claire. Have you got any more announcements? Yeah, I'm going to call N- Nancy and Mike up, please. Yes, but N- Mike has an announcement for me, right? Where is he? Nancy is doing the job. Good old. It's always good to get the woman, isn't it, Nancy? When the man disappears... This is my banner. Thank you. Don't go away, please. Oh, can you hold it away? Oh, um, hi, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Nancy. From Everybody knows you, Nancy. Adra. 
Except I'm short. I've got Molly up there, who's also at ADRA, she's doing lighting, and Mike, who's doing floor manager. But I've got these two very important ladies. Why I'm here? I'll show you why. Oh, thank you. This is what I was wanting to show. You've got to do something that we are actually needing. Don't go away with the mic. I'm holding it all now. First, thank you very, very much to every single one of you for filling up the ADRA container at the outside. We, New Hope Church, is at the top of the list who provide food every Sabbath for the last month of July, followed very closely by Peter Butcher's church at Windsor. Windsor, and then by Castle Hill Richard's church. I have got here samples of what we are really needing right now. Cereal for breakfast for homeless people. The number of homeless people has just tripled in the last month. We also have got this here, wheat bix and the little milk, which is easy for them, and we provide them with a cup and a spoon. Here I have got tuners, this size tuner are for the homeless. Sweet corn, that size, and two sizes of baked beans. And the other size there also comes for the baked beans, uh, spaghetti, sorry. That is one meal for a person. If you get any bigger, they got nowhere to store, they're on the street, they're in little holes that we can spend the night. So these are the products that we really need at the moment. And that churches provide us with the bigger size, the normal size of all of these. But if we're here at New Hope, because I can talk to you, can bring all these small sizes, it will be very much appreciated for the month of August, if we could. Thank you very much. That's it. That's my part. I believe I've got the welcome. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's, uh, it's nice to have everybody here along to Sabbath, uh, to the church service. It's great to see the amount of people that are here. We like to welcome all of those people that are online and be able to uh, hopefully get a blessing from what we are doing here. Where I come from, when we go to church in the morning, we use two languages. It's Yorana, Tahitian, or French, bonjour. But here I would say they can go further and say, Malolele, Talofa, and Kiaorana. And even maybe Bulavinaka. Thank you. God bless you all and enjoy the Sabbath day with us. Good morning. It's time for us to bless the Lord this morning. By that means, I mean it's time to praise God. So please be upstanding with us as we sing this morning. Shine, Jesus, shine.
how does God's glory get out? Okay, that was a, not a rhetorical question. How does glo God's glory get out? It shines through? Through you and through us. And we need to stay connected with Jesus Christ. Amen? So that every day people can see the glory of Jesus Christ. This next song we're going to sing is a beautiful song hymn. And can it be? What amazing love God ha has for each one of us. And that needs to shine through us. Let's sing this beautiful song. attention to the words is yes. that a beautiful verse Amen. do we stand righteous in front of God because of Jesus Christ Amen. we can come to him boldly Amen? Amen but you know what your faces don't show it oh that is so sad again I said last time this is a safe place where you can express your joy and your thankfulness to Jesus Christ Amen Amen, Amen. let's do that last verse again into the chorus
Pastor Mark. Could give Jesus a round of applause. It's because of what he's done for us. Amen. Amen. The last song we're going to sing this morning is Guide Me, O Thy Great Jehovah. your prayer this morning to be guided by Jehovah. Please be seated. All right, we can invite all the kids to come down, as is our custom at New Hope Church, and to get your instrument. And we're going to sing the song, Joy, Joy, My Heart is Full of Joy. One group is going to start, and at a certain point, another group is going to start. So we're going to do it in ladies and gents. So girls and boys, you boys, you follow the men, and girls, you follow us. And I think we'll be the ones that come out on top. Don't worry. And when you sing the song, you've got to have a smile on your face. Parents, you've got to model it. Thank you. Men, you can start. Yeah. 
I'm disappointed in the boys. <laughs> for the second week in the row, I'm, now I want all the boys to come over this side with the men. Don't stand over there for the girls, Manny. <laughs> all the girls over here. Now, men out there. We can't hear the parents singing. I think Lauren. you've got to stand up. Yes. I know some of you don't like it, but you've got to stand up, especially the men. Women, feel free to stay sitting if you like. <laughs> but all men must stand up. All men. And the women, you can stand up too if you want, but we don't mind because we're looking for the men to take it home. Now, this time, will the boys start again? Yep. Yes, that's all yes. right. Yes. We're going to sing it twice. And we're going to do them, right, Jackson? Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. So let's have another go at this, gentlemen, and let's sing like we're glad to be here praising the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's go. Where's Claire? Sorry, I was just a bit into that song. Got distracted from my duties. It's come time for our prayer here at New Hope. And I want to thank you for putting all your requests in the box. And we have a number today. Um, please pray. This is from Marco. Please pray so that my job interview on this coming Tuesday goes well. We will be praying for you, Marco. And more importantly, pray for my family. And we will pray for your family too, Marco. Please pray for Jackie Hunt. She's still going through painful times in her body, so let's pray for Jackie. Um, do you guys remember a little while ago, there was a man who came to Sabbath school and church with Praveen and Shamila. His name was Nathan. Remember? Um, he, we need to pray for him and his family because he has been hit with malaria and chicken pox at the same time. Yeah, that's pretty bad. So let's pray for Nathan. There is an anonymous one here for the Lord to prepare our hearts to receive the answer to our prayers for healing. Please pray for the Lord's comfort to an Adventist family who have lost their mum just this past not long ago. There's a lot of people passing away. Camille and David were telling us that they've lost five people or six people in the last week. Six people in the last week. And then Northy, his family. Yeah, let's pray for all those people around us who are grieving at the moment. Let's pray for, please pray for my daughter has recurring laryngitis. Please pray no, this is a thank you. Thank you so much that my operation went well. Anonymous, but thankful. And I left this one for last because I think this one is just so exciting. We need to continue to pray. Let's not forget for Lily. Please pray for Lily and Peter. Let's pray for all those people in our congregation who are going through really hard, tough times with health because I know there's a fair few. Let's pray for Sol. Um, but there's exciting news because God has answered one of our prayers that was really serious. You remember we were praying for Charlie? She was a 17-year-old girl in intensive care who had like full body organ failure, basically, and they thought she was going to die. And we've been praying with her for a number of weeks. Well, great news is she's out of intensive care. Still having some dialysis, but kidneys have started to work and she's recovering well. Amen. 
Amen. God is good and God answers our prayers. So let's be thankful and grateful as well as asking for things as well. But if you're going through something tough and you think, well, you know, I don't think he's going to answer, take heart because he does answer. He always answers. And sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says something better. But he always answers. So let's pray now and let's put our requests before God and our thank yous. And at the end, I'll finish. I'll give us just some time in silent prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful today. We're thankful that you have answered the prayer of Jeanette and Milan for their, for their relative, Charlie. We thank, we're thankful that she has another chance at life. Father, we're grateful that you are a God who has our lives in your hands and that whether you see fit to let us be laid to rest or you raise us up, we know that there is heaven to be, to be uh, rejoiced over and expected and hoped for. Father, we can't wait to see your face. We look forward to you coming in the sky soon. And Father, we just ask today that you will help us to share the hope that you've given us with everyone that we meet. Father, put it inside us so that it comes out. So that when we, whoever we meet, that it rubs off and they can see that there's something different about us. Father, please help us to be truly converted Christians. Help us to, to love as you love and to care as you cared. And Father, today as we, as we worship you, we ask that you help our hearts to be in the right place and that you will help our motivations to be true. And we also ask, Father, that you will... Be with our, our speaker today and you'll help him to speak your words and may he be blessed from his experience as well. And we thank you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to take our offering up, but just before we do, we're going to meet our new president, um, Pastor Terry Johnson. I'm wondering if you can come up here. Um, we'll just get another microphone for you. Let's give him a warm new hope welcome. Now... I wonder how many of you out there actually know Pastor Terry? Well, you're at home, brother. <laughs> Is there no one? Okay. All right. Well, welcome to Sydney. Fantastic. I love it. It's one of the reasons we came. Nobody knows us. I have no past. <laughs> tell us, where do you actually, tell us a bit about your background, where you come from, because you, you've got a kind of a mixed up accent yes, there. Yes, yes. So I was uh, born in France to an Icelandic mother and a Mauritian father. We might know your mum and dad, by yes, the way. Yes, you do. Erna and Eddie Johnson. Eddie works at Adra Blacktown, and Erna is the Women's Ministries Director for the South Pacific Division. So I'm, uh, I'm the youngster. You're in the a whole blue blood thing. Adventist, brother. That's it. Fourth generation Adventist minister. My wow. great grandparents were some of the first Seventh day Adventists in Mauritius back in 1916 and 1917. And uh, my great grandfather became a lay pastor, and my grandfather became the first educated minister, and then my father and myself. Wow. And, we have an uncle as well who's also a minister. And on my mom's side, we've got two who are ministers as well. So uh, quite a shocking history of Levitical pastoral <laughs> strength. Tell us some more about yourself. You're married, children? Yes, so I'm married to the wonderful Kimberly, who's by herself at home this weekend because the children, Kirsten and Alec, are at Pathfinders. And my daughter is 18, turning 19, and she's one of the counselors for the Pathfinder Club at Livingston Church. And my son, who is turning 14 this year and really turning 35, is, uh, is uh, one of the Pathfinders out there in the cold, minus one degree, and I'm loving it because <laughs> he's in pain, and that's a good thing for a boy of that age. <laughs> hey, um... Your ministry, you were telling me you've been in the ministry a long time, yeah. over a quarter of a century. Yes. Tell us a bit about where you've been, what you've done. So I graduated from Southwestern Adventist University in Texas. Is and, that, is that um, where you met your wife? It's where I met my wife, okay. Kimberly. Her father was a teacher at Southwestern, and the two of us uh, met in our freshman year, first year of university, fell in love, and uh, stayed together while she went to Spain for a year to learn Spanish. 
and got married uh, right out and worked in Texas, then went up to Andrews University for the master's degree and worked with Dwight Nelson for two and a half years. Well, that would have been a privilege. Man, sitting at that man's feet and listening to the way that he preached, yeah. unbelievable. So it was a real blessing to work with Dwight and the team there at Pioneer Memorial Church. And then from there, I went to a little church in Texas that had nine members. So I went from a church where every Sabbath there were 2,000 people worshiping and praising the Lord to a church with nine members and one lady that played the piano. Her name was Auntie Rose, and she had 24 hymns that she knew by heart. And we would just recycle them from week to week. And uh, God blessed us so in that So music wasn't church. an issue in that church? Never was an issue. Uh, in that church, what was the issue was the, the black-white divide. It was the eastern okay. part of Texas, and a kilometer out of town was where New Hope church was and that was the black church and the white church was in the middle of town and we were able to grow that church from 9 to 42 in 12 months and That's so fantastic. the conference figured I was all right and they, they took me on to another church at that point in but time. Did you say 9 to 42 in 9 months? Correct. How did you do that? We went visiting. That was all we did. We went and visited people and just invited them to come to church. There were a whole bunch of, of uh, former Adventists who were married to non-Adventists, and they all decided to come back to church. And we had a marvelous time, celebrated their 100th anniversary the year that I was there. And I was only there for a year and a bit. Funny you say that, because a lot of people who have come to New Hope and become members have come back. Incredibly, it's the name of that church was... New Hope. <laughs> Your church or the black my, church? My church, yeah. Our it was church. called New Hope? Yes, yes. Well, then you've got an affinity with New Absolutely. Hope, don't you? I was feeling very comfortable worshipping here this morning. It was fantastic. Yes. Okay, <laughs> we'll remember that. <laughs> uh, is this about the money again? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's always about the money. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. <laughs> um, so you worked in Texas? Tell, keep yes. Going. So from Texas, um, worked there for nine years in the Killeen area, and then uh, got a call to come to, to New Zealand. And we ended up in five years in New Zealand at a church that was fantastic. It had gone through incredible conflict, and it split, and they were down to 70 members. And we ended up building a brand new church building, so I know about money, and then also <laughs> increasing the membership to 220 in the four years there before they invited us to come and be youth directors in, uh, in Perth. Where so when you went to youth in Perth, that was yeah. your first time in youth First work. time. And you would have been, yeah. what, I was 15, 30, 16 years into the... I was 38 years old at that time. Wow. Had you always yeah. had an interest in youth? Uh, always been involved in youth, but only as a minister, never in terms of the focus. Yeah. So you kind of like youth work, right? Yeah, I love young people. They're, they're exciting, they're interesting, they're challenging, they've got faith issues, you know. I love doing premarital with young people. And the first question I ask is, are you sleeping together? <laughs> you should see the answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> oh, it's good fun. I was going to say, I'm glad he didn't do my premarital <laughs> counselling, but... <laughs> oi, that, oi. <laughs> no, we went the journey. We went the journey. But what an interesting question. Uh, young people, we know who to send you to. Absolutely. <laughs> um, good fun. Okay. So you a uh, one conference... Youth director, is that right? Correct. Which is unusual, eh? Yeah. Because like, you went, and then you did something that I suppose a few youth directors have done, but yeah. not a lot. You went to a, a special job in yes. the West. So after seven years as youth director, they invited me to come and become the, uh, the president. And I stood up. I never wore ties. I was always wearing shirt, uh, T-shirts and shorts. And so Ooh, I... I like this guy more and more. <laughs> it, it's very difficult for me to actually wear a tie. I think the ties are actually of the devil. That's my personal feeling. You're uh, very welcome at New Hope, fantastic. brother. Fantastic. <laughs> no, I'm not quite that bad. But, you know, there's, there's a use for you know, ties. You know I only put a suit on because you were coming today. Oh, well, I only put <laughs> no, a suit not on. True. <laughs> now, suits are important, and they're, they're, they, they serve their function for weddings and funerals in particular. Uh, <laughs> And for church as well. It's important for church as well. And, and you know, and it really depends on the church that you're yeah, going to and, and, and how you're engaging with the community. But, yeah, it was... So you've been a president for how long? Just over four years. Four years. Yes. How did you find it? Well, it must have been all right because you're yeah. here. Loved it. I, I've really loved it. I've loved the challenge. I've loved the hatred. I've loved the love. You know, it's, it's amazing how many people... I've already had people here uh, sending me little emails just going, I've heard one of your sermons. 50% of it's okay, 25% is not so okay, 25% is downright heresy, so oh, I think I, I'm going to fit right in. I thought, that, I thought I sent that anonymously. but <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, the truth is, last night, because I heard he was in Sydney and maybe thinking about coming here, and so I said to him, well, you've got to preach, and I actually went online, did I not, Lizka? And I was... I shouldn't say this, but I went to sleep listening to you <laughs> preach last night. <laughs> That's not true either. <laughs> I listen to you were at a, um, your church over there, I think. At Livingston. Hen, was it Henderson? Or oh, Livingston? in New Zealand. 
Oh. Or the one in, in No, it was the one in West Livingston One of the Pratt Church, boys yeah. was there dedicating a kid, so Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Anyway, it was yeah. a good sermon and yeah. we're looking forward to your preaching. So it must have been if you've only really been the president for four years in the West, which is not long, it must have been a bit of a when you got called here, a bit of a tear. Very much so. It's, it's actually been quite a journey for us. And the reason we're coming is we believe God's calling us. Uh, yeah. We really struggled. My children struggled the most. Uh, Kirsten. Because you never said yes straight away, eh? No, it took six days. And we actually allowed the kids to make the decision on their own. They didn't know that they were the ones that were making the decision. But if they had said no, we would have stayed in WA. But yeah. uh, both uh, my daughter has a struggle with, with mental, cognitive association and social uh, issues. And... We've been looking for the last four years to what to do with her once she graduated from high school. And she's graduating with a completion, not with a certificate. And we found the Barbara Arrowsmith program here in the Sydney area. They're starting it in Perth next year, but here it's actually supported by the NDIS. And she has access to that, which means that uh, for us that was a real important yeah. consideration. But she had to be comfortable coming. And over the five days that we were praying and discussing, she came to her own conclusion. We tried to make sure that we didn't manipulate in any way. And she came to me on Sunday night and said, Daddy, I think it's time for us to move. Yeah. And we broke down in tears and said, all right, let's go to the big smoke where it takes an hour and 45 minutes to get from the airport to our home. <laughs> Currently, it takes me 18 minutes to get to work. And I think it's going to take me 35 from now on. And, uh, and that's on a good day, I understand. The, the good thing going for you, though, is never has there been a concentration in Australia of so many people who need to hear Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing, too, is that within the Sydney area, I think the conference really encapsulates about two hours of driving, doesn't it? Mm. Whereas in WA, yeah. the two furthest churches are 38 hours apart by car. Wow. 38 hours apart. We're closer to the capitals of Asia than we are to Canberra in Western Australia, and uh, the Nullarbor is not just about having no trees, it's about a divide of philosophy of life, yeah, <laughs> it yeah, really is. Yeah. They still are thinking about seceding from time to time in the West. Hmm. Um, now, I know this might put you on the spot a bit, but you're our president, <laughs> um, you are serving right now, as yes. I understand it. Yes. What vision do you bring into our conference for the church here? Because it, it must be exciting to come to Sydney the biggest city in Australia, the best city in Australia, amen? And that's from a Queenslander. What, what's your vision? That's a very good question, Lloyd, and it's one that I'm going to be developing over the next few months. I've been in conversations with some of the ministers and with Sven and a couple of other folk, and really it comes down to looking at what Michael and the team have already put in place and, and accepting what's already been done, following through with that, and just tweaking it here and there where I think that we need to be a little bit more focused in terms of strategy and enthusiasm. Last night, I was at the Blacktown Church and we were meeting with a group of folk who have come together to start the first Southern Asian church plant in Sydney, where we're gonna be focusing particularly on Hindus. Mm. And uh, we've just hired Pastor Charles Jaya, who's gonna be the new minister. And seven people stood up last night and said that they were going to be a part of that missional group that's going to think over the next year of what it's going to mean to actually make an impact in Sydney. We've got 90 churches in Sydney, but I can tell you this. Just from coming from the outside, those 90 churches tend to feel slightly independent of each other. <laughs> and we've got to find a way of getting together the sisterhood of churches, number one. And number two is to recognize that when it comes to making an impact for the kingdom of heaven, we need to be missional in our communities. And that doesn't mean just coming to church and worshiping. That's yeah. part of the joy of celebrating the missional presence that we've had over the seven days or the six days preceding. And when we come together, it's about encouraging one another. It's about uh, making sure that we're really solidly foundational in terms of our identity. Love the worship this morning and the Sabbath school this morning. And I think those two things really bring together this understanding yeah. of missional communities yeah. that are engaged in their uh, local surrounds. The question that we asked last night of the, of the new church plant was, in six years' time, when I come back to speak to you and we make you into a church, if you were to die overnight, would your community miss you? And if they don't miss you, then you failed. You might have a lot of people in church, but you really haven't made an impact. Mm. Christ made an impact wherever he went. As soon as he came into a town, the town knew that he was there. And we normally are so quiet that people don't know that we're here. Even when we had 5,000 people together in the month of March listening to Dwight Nelson, 
Nobody knew that we were there. So we've got to find ways in which to actually engage in doing that far better. And yeah, it was, it was exciting to see Nancy up here with Mike talking about ADRA. The more engaged we get with those kinds of projects, I think the more we're going to see a fruit from that. Could I say that, where's Claire? That's why, that question you said, would they miss you? Yeah. That's why what we do next Sunday with Yes We Care is so important. Amen. And it's why that if we have you, our people, and I'm looking out, most of our members are here today. It's so important that we get out into the community and support Claire and involve ourselves in this missionary work because that's really yeah. where the rubber hits the road. Well, look, you know what? We're glad you're here. I, I can genuinely say I'm excited you're here. Fantastic. And uh, I think you're going to bring a, a, a breath of fresh air to our conference. And, and In fact, I asked someone, who's this Terry Johnson? <laughs> What's he like? I can't even remember who it was. It might have even been Hunty. And they said he loves church plants. I thought, you beauty. <laughs> this is that money thing again, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> In the front, no, no, it's not. I was excited because it's not just the money, although money does help. Um, we want to plant yeah. out of this church more yeah. churches. And if we have a president who supports that, yeah. that's going to make it a lot easier. And we're glad you're here. Well, and look, and I, um, and I love to think of the idea of church planting out of the health of a church. The healthier you are as a church, the more church plants you'll actually have over the next few years. And this will become the mother church mm. birthing out churches that radiate out as spokes that come yeah. back here to get re-engaged, to get refocused and back out to their communities, making yeah. an impact. That's what we dream. Yeah. That's what I love. Welcome. We're glad to have you here, brother. Thank you, Lloyd. Yeah, let's, let's welcome him again. We're going to take our offering up. You know, last week, Liz uh, counted the offering. Praise God. I think it was one of our record weeks, $9,000. Amen. Just praise God for your faithfulness. If you want to ask the Lord, oh, thank you, Liz. If you want to ask the Lord, one of the reasons that he's blessing us is because of your faithfulness when it comes to your offerings and tithes. And look, you can, and I praise God for this in our church, you can give online. Have we got the video, uh, not the video, the, the address? you just got to go to www.findjesus.tv and hit donate. Don't worry about TV ministry. That takes you straight to the New Hope page and you can pay your tithe, you can pay your offerings. And I, I, I think I said it last week, where's Praveen here? Wave, oh, right behind me. Maybe more than 50% of our income comes from online. Is that right? Yes. That's a yes. That's true. Yeah. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I think the more we go into the new age, you know, the more we're going to see, especially from my generation, I'm 53, but really I'm online downwards. We're going to see that's the way we do it. So let's ask the Lord to bless us uh, to take this offering and to multiply it in great ways so we can continue his work. Dear Lord, now as we give our offerings, we pray that you'll bless it, that you'll multiply it like you have been. Oh, we give you honour for what you've been doing in the past. And we look expectantly to the future. Be with us now, Jesus, as we give in your name. Amen. We're going to sing this song that we learnt last week. Old song that many, other, many of you know anyway, but for a lot of people they didn't know it. Surely goodness and mercy. I think we're going to take the offering up as we sing it, but then toward the end I might get... Oh, and you guys to get him to stand and maybe even repeat the last verse again if we need to. Let's sing it.
stay standing as we sing one more. Sweet Jesus. start with a word of prayer together. Father, we come before you and we are reminded by the words of that song that you truly are more precious than anything else that we can place any value into. And we know, Lord, that where we place value today, it always ends up being fleeting and tarnished. But when we place value in you, you give us purpose and in particular, you give us significance. I on my own am nothing, but in you I am a child of God, a prince of who is dwelling in heavenly places, as the Apostle Paul says. And as we talk about a life of significance today, I just pray, Father, that the words of Scripture will come alive, that stories that we have long known may have a new flavor, one where the smell is not only good in your nostrils, but in an ours and wakes up inside of us the deadness that sin has created. And we pray in your name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, your iPhones, or your Androids, or your iPads, or your tablets, open it up and find for me the book of Genesis, chapter 29. Find your scriptural app. And Genesis chapter 29, and we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 29 and a story that you know very well. It's a story that most people have heard throughout their lives, whether they've been coming to church or not. And it's a story that quite often we actually only get a little bit of the reality of the, of the situation. It's the story of Rachel and Leah. It's a story that we know well because it, it appeals to us because it's so twisted and devastating in the consequences of the story itself. And it's a story of deception of a man named a deceiver who is himself deceived so often and realizes that at the end of his life, things were not quite what they appeared. If you come to Genesis chapter 29 and in verse uh, 6, the Bible tells us that Jacob had been flying away from his family, 
running away as fast as he could, and he gets to a well. And when he gets to the well, he sees a lot of people there, and he says to them, ask them, is he well? Laban, he's talking about his uncle. Yes, he is, they said, and here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. Look, he said, the sun is still high. It's not time for the flocks to be gathered. So let's water the sheep and take them back to the pasture. And all the shepherds said, we can't until all the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. And while he was still talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep. For she was a shepherdess. She had a job. And when Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of Laban, his mother's brother. This is his first cousin, mind you. And Laban's sheep, he went over, rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well, watered his uncle's sheep, grabbed her, kissed her, and began to cry like a little baby. Now, I want to ask you women, how many of you have had a man walk down the street whom you've never seen, grab you, kiss you, and then cry because of your beauty? <laughs> and how many of you married him? It's a shocking story when you think about it, isn't it? The idea that a man would actually walk down, feed your sheep with water, and then grab you and kiss you and cry. I don't know if he was crying because he was so alone. I don't know if he was crying because she was so gorgeous that he had never seen anything like it because he was a desert nomad, and therefore the only women he had seen were his sisters. I don't know what the issue was. But the Bible tells us clearly that when he saw Rachel for the first time, he was overcome with emotion. And he tells her, he says, hey, I'm your first cousin. And the Bible tells us, if you read the rest of the passage, that she runs away from him as fast as she could. And I say, good on her. She gets all the way home and she tells her father, Dad, you're never going to guess what happened. This man came out of the desert. He was dusty. He was, he was full of dirt everywhere. He told me he had been sleeping on a rock and he had this kind of vision. This man grabbed me and kissed me. Now at home, on the fire mantel, I've got a couple of shotgun shells. My daughter, who's 18 and quite lovely, hasn't had a boyfriend because they know that I'm the president. <laughs> the other thing they know is because I share this story when I go to high schools and, and, and do chapels is that if a boy comes over to see my daughter, when he walks through the door, I'm going to toss him the shell and say, this goes a lot faster after 10 p.m. <laughs> well, Laban doesn't do that, the Bible tells us. The Bible actually says that Laban ran as fast as he could to go and see his nephew and invited his nephew to come home and to spend time with him. We pick up the rest of the story in verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters, and the name of the older one was Leah, and the name of the younger one was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Now I just want to stop there and say that we don't quite get the flavor of this story in the English. When we're reading it in the Hebrew, the sounds of the names of the Hebrew, and I'm not very good at Hebrew, so I've learned this from, re from research, the sounds of the names in Hebrew have meaning to the Hebrew ear. When somebody says the name Leah, the word Leah actually sounds very similar to a Hebrew word meaning disgusting, unpleasant, not pretty. And the, the, the English translation that we have here is weak eyes. And there's been a lot of debate as to what the weak eyes meant. Was she nearsighted? No. We're not sure that that's really what it means. It seems to indicate that with the connotation of the name and the sound of the name, that she actually was, she would cause people to be weak when they looked at her. She wasn't lovely. There was something about her that wasn't quite right. Whereas on the other side, her sister Rachel, whose name sounds like the Hebrew for you, E-W-E, -E, a female sheep, was lovely in form and beautiful. So it's clear that when it came to Rachel, Rachel was not only lovely in terms of her facial features, but her structure was of such a nature that men felt that it was important to write that she was lovely in form. And it's interesting that Jacob, who is known as the deceiver, when he first meets Rachel, he falls in love with her, in lust with her probably more than in love. He did what most young men do, which is he saw the woman 
and realized that she was good to look at. You know what this means, right? You're walking down the streets of Sydney and you see the men who are holding the hands of their wives and another woman comes up and they're pretending not to look at her. It's the same kind of idea where he actually was taking the time to look at her physically and not look at Leah because Leah did not look the same. So Leah sounds like disgusting. Rachel sounds like you, female producing sheep, which means that when her parents first saw her, when she was born, mom and dad looked at Rachel and said, wow, this girl is going to produce a lot of children. And therefore, she's going to be valuable. Because in that day and age, as a woman, the only value that you had was in the production of male heirs who were going to be able to take care of the farm. So when they looked at Rachel, they saw Rachel as being valuable right from the get-go. Whereas when they looked at Leah, they looked at a, oh, a liability. Someone who was going to be hard to marry off. Which is why the Bible tells us the rest of the story in verse 19. Laban said, <clears throat> it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Because Jacob has said, it's time for me to get married. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. But they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. And then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. For my time is completed and I want to sleep with her. And so Laban did. But Laban did it smartly. He got Jacob to the point <clears throat> where Jacob's mind wasn't working quite as clearly as it should have been. And in the process of his mind going to sleep, the Bible tells us that Laban, his uncle, switched the women. And so in the morning, on the day of Leah's wedding, first of all, she realized that she was part of the con to Jacob. And secondly, in the morning when Jacob wakes up and turns over and looks at his wife for the first time, expecting to see the lovely in form and beautiful Rachel, he sees the disgusting Leah. You can imagine the kind of reaction that he must have had. And you can imagine that again in Leah's life, the lack of significance that she must have felt because her husband did not value her. To know that he was going to have to work another seven years because he made a deal with his uncle. Let me work another seven years. Give me Rachel. She's the one I love. And on and on the scriptures go. Can you imagine how insensitive this whole thing must have been for Leah? The Bible tells us in verse 30 that Jacob lay with Rachel also and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years because of it. And when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, in verse 31, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And this is where the story becomes quite interesting. Because the names of the individuals of the sons that are born are like little daggers of attacks against Rachel from Leah. The first child that's born, Leah became pregnant in verse 32 and gave birth to a son. And she named him Reuben, for she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery, surely my husband will love me now. You see, in the Hebrew, the word Reuben actually stands for, sounds like I should say, He has seen my misery. But the word itself, the name itself, actually means one who sees or see a son. And just think about this. It's breakfast time. And disgusting comes in to the deceiver who's looking at his you. And as they're looking at each other, they're having their bowl of sanitarium, wheat bix, and so good, or unsweetened coconut, whichever one you please. And in comes, see a son. And Leah looks at Rachel and says, see, a son. <laughs> How many do you have, Rachel? Oh, that's right, none. Ha, ha, ha. See your son. Hey, Jacob, see your son, the male heir. Oh, it gets better. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son in verse 33, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Simeon sounds like he who hears, God who hears. Which seems to indicate that Rachel was more than likely not 
feeling like God was hearing her, but Leah was feeling very clearly that God was hearing her. And she names her second child, he who hears. God is hearing my prayer. Rachel, is he hearing your prayer? Oh, wait a minute. See a son. Ah, he who hears. And she gets pregnant a third time. Again, she conceived in verse 34, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. And so she named him Levi. And Levi sounds like the Hebrew word for attached. Three sons. Rachel has no sons. Leah is ahead three nil in the game. And then verse 35. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord, and she named him Judah, and then she stopped having children. It's interesting that it took X amount of years to get to the point where Leah started to realize that no matter what she did, her husband was not going to love her in the same way that God could love her. That her husband was always going to see her as the disgusting one, the one that I have to do my duty with. Her husband would have, would have been intimate with her because at least she was producing children and she was producing male heirs, which meant that she had some value, but he didn't love her. He didn't really care for her very much. He really loved Rachel because Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. So in his youthfulness, his attachment to his wife was about her outward appearance. And Leah changes her tactics. From attacking her sister with, see, a son. Ah, oh, he's hearing me. He's not hearing you. He's attached to all of a sudden saying, no, this is not about me. This is about the one who truly cares. The one who's truly given me significance. He is the God. And therefore, I'm going to name my fourth son, Judah. God be praised. And we start to see something very interesting about Rachel and about the relationship between Rachel and Jacob in the next chapter. Verse 1, chapter 30. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. And so she said to Jacob, give me children or I will die. Now, I found that very fascinating, don't you? She's very clearly recognizing that Leah is having a lot of children. And I'm assuming because of the fact that he is in lust with her more than he is in love with Leah, that he's spending far more time in an intimate manner with Rachel than he is with Leah. And yet every time that he's with Leah, she gets pregnant. And every time that he's with Rachel, nothing happens. And Rachel, instead of asking the Lord, what's the problem between me and you, God, like Leah was finding out, Rachel blames her husband and says, give me children or I'm going to die. And you can imagine the kind of blue that there must have been in the family that night because the Bible tells us in verse 2 that Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? This is not my thing. I mean, I'm producing. You're not. And I cannot say that it's my fault. And so Rachel then does something really quite odd, particularly from our point of view as Westerners who believe in one man, one woman equals one marriage. She says to him, here is Bilhah, verse 3, my maidservant. Why don't you sleep with her so that she can bear children for me and that through her I too can build my family? And Jacob being Jacob says, sure, why not? Why not? I've been sharing this text with my wife for a few years, and she's not of the same opinion <laughs> as Rachel. And I wonder why. The amount of pain that comes as a result of Jacob ending up with four wives by the end of the day is really quite disturbing. The family that becomes the foundation of the nation of Israel is a messed up family. They're completely dysfunctional. They hate each other. They're struggling with one another. They have no real purpose for why they're there on earth. It must have been very difficult for Jacob as he was getting older and changing his name from Jacob to Israel to recognize that as a father, he had not done as good a job as God would have asked of him. So she gave him her servant. And Jacob slept with her, verse 4, and she became pregnant again with the pregnancy. And Jacob is as virile as they get. And she bore him a son. And Rachel said, 
God has vindicated me. And so she named the boy Dan. And Dan means vindication. So let's go through the score. How many does Leah have? Four. How many does Rachel have? Very good. Zero. And how many does Bilhah have? One. But she thinks it's her child. And she claims him as her child. And she gives the zingers back to Leah. Look, God has vindicated me. I am vindicated. He's speaking to me. And I think quite often when we're looking at our own lives and thinking about the significance in our own lives, that when it comes down to it, we often feel like that we're connecting with God and speaking to God and things happen around us and we believe that God is vindicating the decisions that we've made as a result. When maybe that's not quite the case. Maybe because our hearts are deceitful above all things, as the minor prophet says. We're actually convincing ourselves that what, God, what, what has happened around us must be of God instead of being humble enough to realize that we are manipulating the, situ- the circumstances into our own way of thinking. Well, she goes on, the Bible says she has another child, and it keeps on going. We don't have the time to go and read it through all. But as we're coming through the end of the chapter, when you come to verse 14, during wheat harvest, Reuben went out into the fields and found some mandrakes. So see a son, found some mandrake plants. And I want you to go home this afternoon, and I want you to type in mandrake plant into Google. And when you type mandrake plant into Google, you're going to get an image of what the mandrake plant looks like. And as soon as you see the image of what the mandrake plant looks like, you'll recognize why it was considered an aphrodisiac back in the day. It was considered that if you took this plant, that you would be very, very fertile. And as a result, the intimacy between you and your husband or wife would cause you to actually get pregnant. And so when Reuben found this, He came over and Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. In verse 15, Leah says, what? Isn't it enough that you took away my husband? Are you going to take my son's mandrakes as well? All right, Rachel says. Okay, I'll make you a deal. When Jacob comes home tonight from having taken care of the sheep, he can sleep with you as long as you give me the mandrakes. Are you starting to get a picture of the kind of character that Rachel had. Lovely on the outside, beautiful in form, stunning to look at, but over time we start to recognize that the character that she has is one that is devious, that's twisted, that's manipulative, that lies, and is willing to do anything that she wishes in order to get her own way. And I think that by the time that we get through the story, even though Jacob still loves Rachel, still finds her very attractive, he starts to recognize that this part of her he does not enjoy whatsoever. The Bible tells us that night that when Jacob came home, Leah said, hey, you're mine tonight. And sure enough, she gets pregnant on that very night. And she produces another child, and that child is named Issachar. And you can go and find the name and the value of that name. The story continues. I just want you to think about that every single morning at breakfast. See a son. Disgusting. Oh, you. How are you? God hears me. I'm vindicated. All around the breakfast cereal. What a home. When I think about the television programs like Game of Thrones and all kinds of other programs that that claim to be avant-garde in the way in which they're interacting and talking about sinful human behavior, none of them carry a candle to the story of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. They have no clue as to how messed up life can be until they see the people that God chose to be the foundation of his chosen people. And all I can say is thank God that he did. Because when we see the kind of grace that God gives to them, when we see the kind of significance that God gives to them, when we're looking at our own lives and recognizing the problems that we have in our own lives and we surrender them to God, at that time we can also believe that God gives us significance beyond what we could imagine. If you follow through in Genesis chapter 31, the Bible tells us in verse 31 of Genesis chapter 31 that Laban was chasing after Jacob because some of the household gods were stolen. 
And in verse 31, Jacob answers Laban, I was afraid because I thought you would take your daughters away from me by force, which is why I left. But if you find anyone who has your gods, he shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourselves whether there's anything of yours here with me. And if so, take it. And now Jacob did not know that Rachel had actually stolen those gods. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two maidservants. But he found nothing. And after he came out of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and had put them inside her camel's saddlebag. So she's a thief. And she was sitting on them. And Laban searched through everything in the tent, but he found nothing. And Rachel said to her own father, Don't be angry at me, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence, for I'm having my monthly period. And so he searched but could not find the household gods. She is a piece of work, isn't she? She is fantastic. And the other thing that we need to recognize is that even though Jacob has been sharing morning worships and evening worships with his family at the end of the day, the influence that Jacob had about the God that he had seen and the angels going up and down the ladder that he had seen in vision as he tried to communicate that to his children and to his spouses, really only one spouse had come to the understanding of who the true God was. And that was the disgusting one, Leah, who said... God be praised in the name of Judah, her fourth son. Leah knew God. Rachel never found the one true God. She was always keeping a foot in both camps. One foot here with all the household gods just in case. And one foot here saying, yep, I agree with you. God be praised. Never committing fully. And again, even though she was lovely in form and beautiful, by the time that Jacob becomes a little bit older, he realizes who she is. And we find the rest of the story in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 16. Genesis chapter 35 and verse 16. And the Bible says, Then they moved on from Bethel. And while they were still some distance from Bethlehem, Rachel began to give birth, and she had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't be afraid, for you are having another son. And as she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Ben-Yamin. I want to ask you a question. Who did the naming of all the children as soon as they were born? The mother did, not the father. And yet here, her last wish was that her son be named Ben-Oni, and Jacob intervenes and changes it to Ben-Yamin. Why? Because I think that Jacob started to really understand the depths of depravity that sin had caused in Rachel's soul. You see, the moment that she was dying, and this beautiful little boy, Benjamin, was born, She wanted Benjamin and everybody to be reminded day in and day out of what had occurred on the day of Benjamin's birth. So she named him Ben-Oni, which means the son who murdered me. And as a result of that awful name, the father who had found Rachel beautiful and lovely in form, said, no, we cannot let this boy live for the rest of his days, knowing that at the result of his birth, his mother died. To be called that in the playground of the school, to be called that as a shepherd, hey, murderer of your mother, how you doing today? And so he changed the culture to change the name from Ben-Oni to Ben-Yamin, son of my right arm strength. And he loved the boy. And time passed. And we come to Genesis chapter 49. And in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 29, we're told about the death of Jacob. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 29. And the Bible says, then he gave them these instructions. I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave, in the field of Ephron, 
the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham, my grandfather, bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite along with the field. There, my grandfather Abraham and my grandmother Sarah were buried. There, my father Isaac and my mother Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Rachel. Is that what it says? I buried Leah. Now the Bible tells us in chapter 35 that we, where we just read that when Rachel died, they dug a pit by the side of the road. They laid her body in it and they put up a pile of stones and they kept on moving. Now it was tradition in those days that when the senior patriarchs would die and the matriarchs would die, that they would actually be disinterred, brought back up, and the bones carried to the field or to the cave where the family bones were actually buried. No one did that for Rachel. In fact, the writer of the book of Genesis, Moses, actually suggests that she is still buried in that very same place. But when he dies, he doesn't ask to be buried next to the one who's lovely in form and beautiful. No. When he dies, he decides that he needs to be buried, buried next to the one who truly gave him wisdom, compassion, empathy, love, concern, met his love needs as he had met hers, and over the years, Leah became the woman of his dreams, the woman who was his equal partner, the woman who was his help meet. There's something that happens to men as we get older. The first thing is that we lose our hair. The second thing is that we start to get a belly. It's harder for us to get rid of the belly. And we work hard on getting this belly. There's some of you that are very much healthier than others, but for me, I'm finding it more and more difficult to actually lose my belly. And the third thing that happens is that as I get older as a man, I'm not as much interested in what is lovely in form and beautiful. I'm far more interested in the character of the individual. Good thing, too, because my wife does not look anything like what she used to look like. And neither do I. Gravity has played a part. The eyelids start to droop. The ears get bigger. The nose never stops growing. Isn't that something? And I've got the Johnson nose. It's just spreading across the face. Her nose is even bigger. It's beautiful. I love it. She is beautiful. She changes on the outside. But on the inside, she is a far better woman than the one I married 25 years ago. Hard to believe. But the same thing was true for Jacob. And so when he died, he said, don't bury me next to Rachel. I loved her. I loved her. Well, okay, I lusted after her. The one I truly loved, she's buried in the special place. She's buried in the cave where my family is buried and I want to be buried next to her. Well, the story gets better because you see, when we're looking at each other, we kind of make determinations about the way one person looks and we, we make a determination as to whether or not we're going to be friends based on how that person looks. The reason I do wear a suit and tie is because there are a lot of people who believe that a president should wear a suit and tie. And you know what? On some days in the conference office, it's important to wear the suit and tie because it's like armor. Come in. I'm going to fire you. <laughs> right? A tie can be a sense of power as well. And you can use your, your outward appearance to manipulate other people. And Rachel did that. And if you're looking around at society, society puts an awful lot into the way in which you look. What you drive, where you live, how you actually get about. So many words written on a weekly basis in weekly magazines and newspapers about style. And, and, and women aren't really judged by who they are. They're judged by how they look. 
And when you're looking at, uh, you know, the, the Sydney Herald or, or whatever newspaper is around, half of the magazine, half the newspaper will be spent taking pictures of women. Not so much of men because we just aren't that pretty. And women judge each other. And men judge women. And in the Old Testament, an old man learned that he could not do that anymore. So who had more significance, Rachel or Leah? I think Leah, the disgusting one, definitely had more significance. But when you come to Matthew chapter 1, in Matthew chapter 1, we see what Jesus thought of the whole thing. You'd think, you'd think that the lineage of Christ would come through the most significant person of their day. Verse 1 of Matthew 1 says, A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of... What does Judah's name mean? God be praised. And who was his mama? The disgusting one was his mother. Not the one who had significance. The disgusting one. And that's why when God said to Samuel, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the... It doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. What matters is whether or not the Holy Spirit has had an opportunity to come into your heart and transform you from the life of sin and loss of purpose to a life of holiness and full of purpose. And then you will find the significance that God has always ordained for your life. Thank you, Pastor, for that message. Let's be upstanding as we sing this beautiful hymn on a hill far away.
that beautiful old hymn. We recognize, Lord, that you have given us a life of significance beyond anything that we could have imagined. We may look around at our surroundings, the vehicles we drive, the house that we live in, the high mortgage and rent that we pay, the tolls, the cost of life in Sydney, the way in which we engage in the traffic, the way in which we look at our children and our partners. And we may look and say, Lord, where is the significance? But the significance comes from the fact that you cast your regard upon us and you say, my child, my son, my daughter, come into the kingdom, to the house that I have gone to prepare for you. We may not have significance here in terms of the way the world claims to see significance, but that significance is fleeting, fleeting like the outward beauty of a beautiful woman or man, fleeting in that it has no real meaning and value. But what does is the character that you reproduce in us of your son, Jesus Christ. And it is that that we look forward to seeing in each other and to praying for each other to have. Remind us of this significance as we go through the work of our week. And may it be to your glory and to your honor, we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Johnson. Did you enjoy that? What a wonderful sermon. And we'll invite you back, not because you're the president, but because you preach the word. And we will enjoy it. I want to invite you to stay for lunch. And then don't forget tonight, five o'clock at the Hayora's place. We're going to tear it up and have a good time over there. So um, happy Sabbath. Stay for lunch. And uh, we'll see you out there. Let's do it.